Vitaya, good afternoon. My name is Miroslava Gongazin. Today we are in Ukraine. It's been invaded and threatened by Russia. Putin is demanding the West to leave Ukraine for its Russian sphere of influence. Today we have a chance to talk about the crisis with Secretary of State, U.S. Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity, good for to be your with time, you. and for your effort. So your administration said that uh, Russia can invade any moment. Mm. What is your administration ready to do uh, to defer Russian aggression? Mm. And what would be the three major steps you, will, you are ready to do if Russia will invade mm. tomorrow? Well, first, we've, we've offered Russia a clear choice, uh, a choice between pursuing uh, dialogue and diplomacy on the one hand or confrontation and consequences uh, on the other hand. And we've just been engaged in uh, an intensive series of uh, diplomatic engagements with Russia directly between us uh, through the Strategic Stability Dialogue at NATO with the NATO-Russia Council, at the OSCE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. And my hope uh, remains that uh, Russia will uh, pursue that diplomatic path. It's clearly preferable. Still, what about the U.S.? But to your point, uh, we've, also, we've equally made clear that if Russia chooses to renew its aggression uh, against Ukraine, uh, we, and not just we, the United States, uh, we, many countries uh, throughout Europe and even some beyond, uh, will respond very uh, forcefully and resolutely, and in three ways. Uh, first, uh, we've been working intensely on uh, elaborating extensive uh, sanctions, uh, financial, economic, export controls uh, and others Doesn't and, doing that, and doing that I'm not going to get into the details mm -hmm. of what they are but we're doing that in very close coordination with European allies and partners uh, a second consequence would almost certainly be uh, further uh, assistance uh, defensive military assistance uh, to Ukraine and third it's almost certain that NATO would have to reinforce its own defenses uh, on its on its eastern flank and you know what's so striking about this is that when you think about it uh, President Putin, uh, going back to 2014, uh, has managed to precipitate what he says he wants to prevent. Uh, because, among other things, uh, NATO had to reinforce itself after uh, Russia invaded uh, Ukraine, seized Crimea, uh, the Donbass, uh, after, after that happened. So uh, we've laid out the consequences clearly for Russia, but also, also the far preferable path of resolving differences diplomatically. Uh, and we'll see which path President Putin decides to take. Uh, it's still the question of uh, is the uh, SWIFT cutting Russia from SWIFT mm. if SWIFT is on the table and personal sanctions against personally Putin and his mm. family on the table? W what I can tell you is this, um, and it's not just me saying this, uh, the G7, the leading democratic economies uh, in the world, the European Union, NATO have all each declared as institutions, as a collection of countries, that there will be, and I quote, massive consequences for Russia if it renews its aggression against Ukraine. Uh, we've also said that the measures that we're looking at uh, go well beyond steps that we've taken in the past, including uh, in, in 2014. I'm not going to detail them uh, here or telegraph the steps we take, but I can tell you the consequences would be severe. But again, I want to insist on the fact that uh, it would be far preferable not to have to go down that path. We're fully prepared to do it, but the preference is uh, to see if we can uh, resolve uh, differences, address um, concerns uh, in both directions through diplomacy. Uh, Russia asked for a written response to demand never to accept mm -hmm. Ukraine um, into NATO. Are you preparing to? Are you preparing such mm -hmm. a written response, and what kind? So we've, we we had the last week of these important engagements, uh, as I as I noted, and we now have an opportunity both. Uh, Russia and, uh, and all of us, uh, the United States, our European partners, to take back what we heard um, from each other. Uh, the Russians uh, have gone back and presumably are consulting with, uh, with President Putin. Uh, we've done the same, in my case, with, uh, with President Biden. Europeans have done the same with, uh, with their leaders. And the next step in this process is uh, for me to have a chance to meet with um, Foreign Minister Lavrov in Geneva on Friday uh, and to see what, uh, how, uh, how Russia's responded to uh, what's already been, uh, been discussed. They'll hear, they'll hear from us. Before that, though, I was uh, de uh, determined that President Biden's instruction to come here to, to, to Kyiv 
to consult with our uh, Ukrainian partners, and then tomorrow in, uh, in Berlin to meet with uh, some of our, our closest European partners. That's exactly how we proceeded all along. We've done everything in very close consultation before uh, and after any of our engagements with Russia. However, you didn't answer my question about are you preparing the written response to R Russian demands? Right now, the next step is to meet uh, with uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov. Let's see where, where we are after Friday, and we'll take it from there. Uh, I had that question about Mr. Lavrov. You were, uh, you were scheduled to meet him. Uh, do you see any signs that the Kremlin is changing its position at this point? Point? I can't see that I see any, any direct evidence of that. Uh, unfortunately, we, can si we continue to see uh, Russia having uh, amassed very significant forces uh, on Ukraine's uh, borders. Uh, that process seems to uh, continue. On the other hand, uh, the fact that we are meeting in Geneva, uh, the fact that we will be discussing uh, the um, conversations and exchanges that we've had over the last uh, 10 days, also suggests to me that uh, diplomacy remains a, a, an open possibility, uh, one that we're determined to pursue uh, as long and far as we can. We want to leave no diplomatic stone unturned because, again, that's just a much better and more responsible way to deal with these problems. Uh, the Minsk agreement is seen as the only valuable solution mm. um, uh, for uh, this crisis. However, Russia and Ukraine has a different reading mm -hmm. of the agreement. What has to be done to implement the agreement or it's time to renegotiate mm. uh, its norms? I don't think there's any, uh, any need to renegotiate because, as you say, uh, there is an agreement. In fact, there are actually three of them because Minsk evolved uh, 2014 to 2015. Uh, and there are a number of very clear steps uh, that uh, both of the parties have to take. I think it's fair to say, uh, looking back, that many of those steps Ukraine has either uh, implemented or begun to implement. There are some that it, that, that it ha hasn't yet tackled. I think, unfortunately, it's equally fair to say that Russia has done virtually nothing uh, in terms of the steps required of it in the Minsk Agreement. So the first question is whether Russia is serious about resolving uh, the, uh, the Donbass through the Minsk process. If it is, uh, I agree with you. I think that's the, the best uh, and right now really the only way forward. France, Germany uh, are uh, an important part of this through the so-called Normandy uh, format. Uh, and there are supposed to be upcoming meetings uh, in that process. And again, it's a test of whether uh, Russia is serious about it. The one positive sign that we've seen in uh, the last few weeks when it comes to Minsk is a loose ceasefire that uh, is clearly uh, an improvement over where things were uh, that takes us back to where, uh, where we were in 2020. But uh, the real question is, is Russia serious about implementing Minsk? If it is, we're prepared to, to facilitate that, we're prepared to support that, we're prepared to engage in that, but in support of this Normandy process that France, Germany, Russia, and Ukraine uh, are engaged in. Uh, since you mentioned Germany, uh, you mentioned Normandy format. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a lot of talks about U.S. joining mm -hmm. that uh, that uh, Normandy mm -hmm. format. Is there any uh, reconsideration of U.S. Uh, doing so? I don't think it's a question of us joining the format. The question is whether uh, it's useful for us to try to uh, facilitate things, uh, to support it uh, in any way that we can. Uh, if the answer to that is yes, we're fully prepared to do that, and we've uh, said, of course. Uh, shared that with our uh, allies and partners, France and Germany, but we've also said that to, uh, to Russia and, of course, to Ukraine. Uh, the U.S. National Security Advisor recently said that, uh, that if Russia wants Nord Stream uh, to start operating, mm. it will have to stop aggression in Ukraine. Mm. Is the United States ready to accept the completion and activation of the pipeline mm. for Russia to withdraw troops from the borders? Well, we continue to oppose the pipeline for reasons that are well known and are, and are, and are long known. Uh, we think that uh, it actually undermines Europe's uh, energy security. It obviously uh, does uh, tremendous potential damage to Ukraine, uh, including giving uh, Russia the option to avoid the existing uh, pipeline uh, through Ukraine that results in a lot of transit fees uh, for Ukraine. Uh, and uh, the, list, the list goes on. Having said that, um, the pipeline is actually complete. The construction's been completed. Uh, it's not operational. And to Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor's point, right now uh, that pipeline is as much, if not more, leverage uh, for us as it is for, for Russia because the idea that if Russia commits renewed aggression against Ukraine, uh, gas would flow through that uh, pipeline is highly, highly improbable. Uh, so 
that's an interesting factor to see uh, whether it affects Russia's thinking as it's uh, deciding what to do. And I have uh, uh, two questions on on uh, on the domestic agenda, mm -hmm. Ukraine domestic agenda, if I if I may. Yeah. Um, the President Zelensky promised President uh, Biden uh, personally mm -hmm. to fight corruption. Mm -hmm. Uh, he promised to appoint uh, a special anti-corruption prosecutor mm. before the end of 2021. Mm. Uh, however, many Ukrainians um, argue that there is a sabotage of anti-corruption mm. uh, reform, reforms. Uh, is the United States, um, as a Ukraine strategic partner, satisfied with the reform progress in mm. Ukraine? And is Ukraine at risk of losing the U.S. support I if the government does not meet its uh, commitment mm. to reform agenda? Uh, I had a chance to spend time with uh, President Zelensky today. Uh, we had a very good conversation uh, about virtually all of these issues, uh, including the question of, uh, of reform. And President Zelensky has been pursuing reform, including most recently uh, judicial reform. Uh, but there are other uh, things that, uh, that need to happen, uh, including uh, finally uh, the appointment of this uh, uh, commissioner uh, that uh, should uh, and could take place uh, any time. So we are looking to that. Uh, to see that happen. Um, it's challenging. Uh, there are external pressures, uh, there are internal pressures, uh, but uh, he has been on the path of reform. And ultimately, um, Ukraine's progress, which we are determined to support, uh, is contingent on, uh, on reform. Uh, so we look to the President to continue that, uh, those efforts. Uh, we very much support him in those efforts, uh, and we'll continue to support Ukraine as it makes those efforts. Thank you so much. Uh, they're showing me that I have to cut. I have one more question, though. One more, please. One more question. Um, across from this building where we are, uh, we are going doing this interview mm. today, right? Um, on uh, the hearing, in the court hearing mm. on treason charges uh, brought against the former President Poroshenko, many experts and former Western politicians uh, express their concern, and some say the charges are politically motivated. Mm. Do you think these charges and the and the progress of and the process of uh, or is justified mm. uh, at, the, at the time of looming war? Well, I can't I can't get into the details of this uh, of this particular uh, case. Uh, what I can say is this: it's very important that in in any proceeding, whether it's this one or, or any other, uh, that. Uh, if things go forward, uh, it's through an independent judiciary, uh, pursuant to the rule of law, uh, and as we would say, without fear or favor, uh, no selective uh, prosecutions. That's a general uh, rule that we would apply anywhere and everywhere. Um, second, this is a time, I think, uh, where there's a premium on national unity, precisely because of the, the threat that Russia is posing. Uh, and um, it's important for Ukrainians to come together, whatever political differences they, uh, they may have. Uh, one of Russia's methods is to try to divide, uh, to create uh, divisions, to create distractions. Uh, and it's important uh, for Ukrainians to come together to resist that uh, and to um, uh, deal with the challenge posed uh, by Russia as one, uh, as one country uh, with um, an incredible uh, future uh, that uh, the United States strongly supports, but one that's being challenged. Thank you so much, because I would be escorted from this room. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Good to be with you again. Good to be. Thank you. Good to see you.